So we're speaking this morning, um, apparently you guys have been doing the Book of James, yeah? And um, so I'm a little bit like Sandra Sully with the late news here. I didn't, um, I'm kind of trying to play catch up with where, what's been going on. And five years ago I was asked, um, as I was actually interviewed for my previous uh, role down in, in uh, Victoria, what's your favourite book of the Bible? And James was actually my answer. Um, I love James. James... Um, it's such practical. It's about the, you know, it's moving your, your faith from uh, potentially we have a danger of our faith becoming a theological, philosophical idea of the way that we live our life. And then James puts it into, now, now go and do that. James teaches that the first thing we're supposed to do when we have faith is to live by our faith. You know, get your hands dirty for the kingdom. This is quite practical. And I used to be a carpenter. I like the practical things. And James is just on it. Let's do practical. So what did Pastor David Moyes give me to preach on as my first message at Reedy Creek Baptist Church? Well, of course, he would give me one of the more controversial verses in the book of James. If you're going to ask one of the most common theological questions someone might ask, can you lose your salvation once you're saved? And the two verses he's given me today are the verses that are right smack bang in the middle of that discussion. And so now you're all wondering whether I'm going to answer that question. I'm not even going to bother because I don't know you and you don't know me and there's no point. I'm going to take a different tact on this um, this morning. So bear with me as we go through this. I'm going to be different. Um, I sense that you feel I already am different. It's just I don't know how yet. So... Uh, the surprise is all mine when I figure it out. Like, does David always preach from here? I've got no idea whether I should go up here or whatever. All right. Don't say that. I'm a boundary pusher. I don't do it intentionally, but it just happens. But anyway. All right, so we're going to look at James chapter 5, verse 19, 20. You can turn on your phones. You can open up your Bible. Put your phones in aeroplane mode because when you get a phone call in the service, I'm going to answer it. That's how it goes, yeah? Doesn't really, but anyway. James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20 says this. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone... You know what? There's one thing you should know about me. I'm this close to being dyslexic. I'm, I'm serious. Do you know my enter... You know you go to year 12 and you get an enter score... My enter score was so low that they didn't even print it. Now, that's a testimony for another time. So when I muddle my words up, just go, that's okay, that's Robbie. Because he, he does that a little bit. And you'll learn just to let it go. And I won't bring that up every time I go blah, 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 over a word. You'll just go, that's cool. So let's start again. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Go preach on that. Okay. I just want to point out my brothers and sisters. Now, normally if I was preaching on this and you didn't know me, and I, and if I knew you and you knew me, I probably wouldn't camp on my brothers and sisters. But today I thought, actually, no, I want, to, I want to just stop even on this very basic concept of being a brother and sister. Because you don't know me, and I don't know you, but I already have an affinity of being family with you. And hopefully you already have an affinity that this stranger who you do not know just loves Jesus, and I, I want to hear from him about Jesus have you ever been to a church before when you're visiting? Or hopefully this is most of us. You don't know anyone and you're walking to that church in that strange place with all those strange people and yet some, you feel the familiness of it. Has anybody, hands up, experienced that before? Yet? Okay, not enough of you go on to go to church when you're on holidays. But anyway, let's put that aside. It's okay. Brothers and sisters, we are family. Now this idea of being family... Is, was completely scandalous in the first century. Now just think for a minute 
What did the Jewish nation do for hundreds of years? They protected their identity as Jewish people. They, there was no idea. If you were to say to a Jewish person that the Roman and the Samaritan, and they are your brothers in a spiritual sense, it, the whole idea, the concept was scandalous because family distinctions, national distinctions were deep. People identified with their own people. And you don't identify with the outside. In fact, for a non-Jewish person to be brought into the, you know, the, the New Testament Jewish faith, there was a whole step of processes of where essentially they would have to quite literally transform from what they were to who they could be. And then when they were brought into the Jewish fold, they were still never, ever quite Jewish. So this idea of brothers and sisters about being believed was completely outrageous when it was first written down. Now, you and I, we've grown up with this idea and we kind of know about it and so it gets a little bit, yeah, we're family and we're brothers and sisters. But I reckon sometimes we can know about it but it's much harder to actually live about it sometimes, yeah? The Bible teaches us that Jesus paid the way paid a price so that you and I can be adopted, we just sung it three songs ago, as children of God, adopted into his family, out of a broken one and into a whole one, a complete one, out of the wilderness and into a home where he has a room prepared for me. Did we just sing that? I didn't know that song. We are family. John says, first, there's a phone. I'm not even going to point someone out. The new person can't embarrass everyone else. Everyone look up there while they dig for it and turn it off. One John says, as many as received him, so everyone, as many that received him, everyone, to them he gave the he gave the right to become children of God. And then Ephesians one five he goes he predestined uh, us to adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to Himself through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will. So this concept of being family is not unfamiliar to Christians. It's not it's not new to us. It's not so scandalous. It's none of those things. We've grown up with it. But the familiarity of the concept of being in a family of God doesn't mean that we, can, that we live it out with any greater fulfillment than what maybe new first century Christians thought of when they heard this. See, we put more appropriate distinctions between our separations. We call them denominations. That's a different family. The family of God that made in church. We're the family of God that made in this one over here. We'll distinction it. We'll put, and that's way more acceptable to us. It's politically correct, theologically incorrect. We will put these divides to us. And then what we sometimes do, well not sometimes, then we create this hierarchical of, of um, command within a church. I don't need to point at any specific system. But you might have pastors and you might have, if you go to a, a, another church, they might call it, I'm on staff. Or um, if you go to another church, well, I'm the bishop or, or, or you're someone else. And then, and then everybody else is the laity. All right? So you've got all these ones and you've got the laity. And of course, we separate and we divide. We give less, less spiritual, we expect less spiritual responsibility from the laity. But from the professionals who do it for a living... Um, that, that's the professionals. And so often we, we, we put these distinctions to separate, to segregate, to divide us. And even though we know that we're all family, we, we, we don't live it, live it out with any more fulfillment of a whole bunch of others. With any congregation, living as a family is hard, yeah? It's hard. I mean, it's hard enough to live with your flesh and blood family sometimes, let alone some of the crazies in the kingdom of God. Because there are some serious crazies, Right? doesn't matter where you sit on a spectrum of what's normal, there is crazies. There's probably two crazies going, that person's crazy, pointing at each other, thinking that they're normal. But it's not easy 
to live as a family. I mean, the reality is that in any congregation, families bicker. That's not how you worship. That's not appropriate. We shouldn't do the offering here. Preaching shouldn't be like that. Or um, there's not enough money going to missions. Or there's too much money going to missions. Or, and I know no one here and I know nothing yet. So if I hit on something, I honestly don't know about it. So I'm not picking on anyone. I'll let you know when I'm picking on you. <laughs> or not. I don't like picking fights. But... So there's bickering within churches as well. And that's all very normal. It appears to be normal, but it's not normal. It's not the way God's created us to be. It's not the way that he wants us to relate to one another. Relationships, they break down inside the church, inside the congregation. We've seen it all. I mean, for a lot of you guys, um, I'm assuming you've been Christians for some time. You've seen this in reality. And it can be heartbreaking, can't it? It can be difficult. So we know the idea is that we're brother and we're sister and everything that that should encapsulate, but living it out in the fullness, it's hard. It's real hard. It's nice when you get the warm fuzzies when you go to a church and no one knows you. It's nice when you preach for the first time and they give you a little bit of grace. But beyond that, you, some of you will get to know me, and it's okay, I'm not afraid of this. I, some people will like the way I speak and some people won't, and that's okay. Because no two people are the same, and you don't want that. Um, and, and, but it takes work to go, I better keep moving on. I do this a lot. I'll go off in a little direction and have to come back and figure out where I am. But here's the thing, right? If we don't understand the concept of being adopted into a family, we won't live as a family. Yeah? If we don't understand the concept of being spiritually adopted as sons and daughters then we will live as spiritual orphans, isolated, alone, trying to protect ourselves because no one else will, back up against the wall, punching from the ropes kind of thing. It's you on everyone else. If we don't understand that we are brothers and sisters with a father who loves us, then we won't allow ourselves to be fathered by a heavenly father who wants to father us. Family is so key to the church. It is so key to Reedy Creek. Because if we don't feel like we're part of the family, if we don't want to be in part of the family, we've got problems because God wants to father this family. And God will never, our Heavenly Father will never push you out the door. I don't know who your father was or mother and how they treated you. But a loving father will never push you out the door, but the door is open and we can leave whenever we like. And when we start forgetting that we're family, when we start forgetting we've got a father that wants to father us, then walking out the door is not hard to do. Yeah, we're we're all susceptible to doing this, but over... Anyway, I... We often pray, Father God, blah, 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 blah. Or Father God, can you, or God, can we, whatever. And he is God and he is Father God. But are you allowing him to father you? Let, let me ask you this. What is the Father fathering you on at the moment? What's he opened your eyes to? Where is Father leading you into a greater sense of your own identity? A greater understanding of the purpose that he has built you for? Because he should be leading every single one of us. Because he wants to. And it's not him that slows that process down. I just want you to um, just, I'm just going to give 30 seconds. What is God fathering you on right now? And hopefully there's something little. He just wants to lead you one step closer into a better understanding of what it is to live with him. Now for me, what is God fathering me right now? Only little things. This is not sermon material. He, He opened my eyes to the fact that the way that I was fathering my children 
was not the way he was asking me to do it, but the way that I'd seen my father father me. That's very normal, yeah. If you, you do any family systems theories or anything, you know, chances are that you parent your kids in a similar way that your parents parented you. Now, my parents are not bad parents. They're believers and they are, you know, they love Jesus and they're great. But it doesn't mean then that I take on an attitude that they had and then project it onto my kids just because that's what they had. Any attitude that I want to project onto mine needs to be from God the Father, not my father the father. (laughs) You know what I mean? That's what he's schooling me on. It's nothing big, but it just makes me remember when I'm fathering my children, oh, God, this is what you're talking about. Change my behavior. Everyone should be living like this day in and day out. Here's the thing, and I ask this because this verse that we're looking at, and I've taken it down up there, and that's fine. It's about backsliders. Yeah? Do-do-do. Backsliders. Whenever we think of the word backsliders, we think of someone generally who has turned their back, someone that's doing incredibly obvious sins. You know, backsliding is such a violent um, visual image. And sure, someone that behaves or turns, walks out the door and behaves in a completely ungodly manner, yeah, probably backsliding, I'd say that. But I'd suggest that more people are backsliding without even realising it. Because backsliding is not so obvious. You know, it's a subtle little thing where the enemy comes in and takes your eyes off the Father and just puts your eyes on other things. And it doesn't have to be that you're backsliding in every section of your life. There might just be one little thing because you know how the slope gets steeper and slipperier as you go? It's never just boom, backslidden. It always just starts with something little. Anyway, backsliding. No one plans on backsliding. It's not something we plan to do. Oh, I'm trying to pick Brad. I know Brad. One of the people I know. Brad, I'm going to go out backsliding tonight. Meet you at 7? Nah, too early. 11.30. But nobody does that because it's not something as believers we plan to do. It's not something that we want to do. The fact that we don't even know that it's actually taking place is quite common. The Bible warns us about this stuff. It says in the last days that this is not going to be uncommon. Now, I'm not doing a last days message here. Not touching that today. But the Bible says that people will fall away. Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly. The Holy Spirit tells us. If you ever wondered if Paul was thinking this stuff himself, not this thought, that in the last times, some people will turn away from their true faith. You know, there's no such thing in the Christian life as a holding pattern. You're either moving forward or you're going backwards. You're either progressing or you're regressing. What does it say, um, uh, Revelation? You're either hot or cold, and if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. It's because lukewarm is like a foot in both camps. Do you know how dangerous you can be to the believers around you if you've got a foot in both camps? Like, imagine there was a key leader in this church. I'm just, I'm not, I, I just thought, gee, what if this is happening, and I don't know. But... Uh, just imagine a key person anywhere, all right, who has got a foot in both camps and the influence they can have on vulnerable Christians. Like, lukewarm is, God will spit that out of his mouth. It's not where you want to be. It's either hot or cold. Because luke, lukewarm brings, I wrote this down, it was good, complacency and compromise, and they are the places where the devil has a field day. If you're going to compromise, <laughs> he wants to know about it. If you're going to get complacent about your walk, he wants to know about it. Another one's in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 and 2. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times for people. Now, I don't normally do this, but I've skipped three verses here. And I'll tell you why, because it lists a whole lot of stuff that people will do when they backslide. And that didn't fit on the screen. So write it down, check it out yourself. Uh, You should know uh, in the last days there'll be difficult times. Uh, People will act religious, but they will reject the power that God that 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 could make them godly. 
just let me say that again. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Where do you think the religious people are on Sunday morning? I'm not pointing my finger at a group of people because I'm in this congregation as well. They're in church. Sometimes as, as believers, if we sit in a seat long enough and become complacent in our faith walk, like if I, when I asked you before, what is the Father leading you on? And you kind of scratched your head and went, um, I don't really know. Now, I'm not saying you're going to hell and you're going to burn. But what I'm saying is that's not where God wants you. That's not, he, he, wants to, he wants to be fathering you and moving you forward. But lots in the last day will reject the power that could make them godly. But they'll look very religious. They'll look like they're doing the right things. That's what lukewarm is, yeah? They know their scriptures. They know their answers. They could have been a Christian for a long time. Or it could be a young Christian that just has had the revelation of Jesus and know that that's not what they should, where they should be and just be okay with that. They walk and talk and they kind of look like Jesus, get them alone in a, in, on, on their own out of accountability and it's not so happening. So where are you at? And it's time to be honest with ourselves. And it's okay. It's okay. You don't get a black star and a, and a fail, an F, if you, if you notice this stuff. I got plenty of Fs in my day, as I said. They didn't even tell me what I got. But anyway. So the Bible tells us about a guy, just quickly, in, in finishing up. The Bible tells us about a guy who backslid, never expected to. No one ever would have picked it. Simon Peter. And uh, he had done three years of intensive discipleship training with Jesus. Sometimes I like, we think, oh, if only I was a disciple, then I would have all the faith, you know. Peter was with Jesus for three years. And he denies Jesus three times, yeah? He recognises that his own... Uh, security could be at, in danger, could be at risk. If he claims to know Jesus, he's going through all the trials and so on and so forth. All of us, if Peter backslid, every single one of us have the potential of doing so also, yeah? And so what is interesting is when Jesus encounters Peter after he's risen, after he's been raised from the dead and so forth, he asked Peter the same question three times. Now, I'm aware most of you probably know this story really well. So he goes, Peter, do you love me? Three times. Because Peter denied Jesus three times. Now Peter, before he denied Jesus, would have said, do I love you? Are you serious? Lord, I would do anything for you. I love you. You are, you are the Messiah. And I would die for you. In fact... He actually said that not that long before he denied him. Nobody, Jesus, loves you more than me. Of course I love you. Hallelujah. Very religious. He would have done, that's what he would have done. This is, this is uh, pre the cross. But the new and what I would say the improved Peter says, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, this here is what is interesting Jesus, you might have heard this before, but anyway, Jesus uses this Greek word for love called agape. Agape. Now, this Greek term for love, agape, uh, he uses it twice. Anyway, it carries this meaning of, of intense, complete, devoted, sacrificial life. Yeah? It's like the deepest of love that you can go. This is the love, the agape that Jesus asked. And then Peter twice uses a different word. He goes, filio. So Jesus said, do you agape me? Are you devoted to me? Are you, will you love me with sacrificial, self-sacrifice kind of love? And Peter goes, oh, filio, I filio you. You know, I like you like a friend. Because filio carries a meaning as love as in friendship love. 
like, like, uh, like, I don't know, I don't know you enough to even say I'll filio you yet, but like I filio a whole bunch of people down in Victoria. It's not that I don't love you, but it's a, anyway. He, so Jesus says, do you agape me, love me with everything you've got? And, and Peter's like, oh, I filio you, Jesus. Yes, you know, I filio you. I love you as a friend. The best he can do is, Lord, you know, all I can commit to you right now is that I like you as a friend. You are my friend. You really are my friend. You know, we can't really completely criticise Peter for this response because it was an honest assessment of where he was at. He was just levelling at Jesus. One of the things we've got to do as Christians is just call it not in um, feistiness but in love. Just call it how it is. Just... Say it, not insensitively, but gift-wrapped with love. Just call it as it is, and Peter just calls it as it is. We shouldn't ever boast about our love for Jesus. Boast only of what Jesus' love for you is. And the reason why is because our love wavers. I mean, heck, it's hard to love your fled and blush, flesh and blood family sometimes. It wavers. Sometimes it's strong and intense and powerful and sometimes it's just hard work. Don't boast of our love for Jesus. Boast of his love for us. Our love is fickle. It runs hot and cold, whereas Jesus' love for you, it never changes. It's always there. That's why, you know, John the Apostle referred to himself as the apostle that Jesus loved. You know, he's not talking in arrogance, just saying how much he knew that Jesus loved him. Every one of us in here just needs to know that Jesus loves us. Even if you've fallen away, so like Peter did, he loves you. He calls you home. He wants to reconcile with you. Draw you back to him. Bring you back into the fold. Bring you back into his family. You know, I don't think Peter was completely outside the family. You know what's interesting? I was trying to contrast Judas and Peter's denial of Jesus in that last moment. It's not a trick question. Do you reckon Jesus would have forgiven Judas if he didn't commit suicide? Should I ask for hands and see what we get? No, I won't do it. I say probably he would have. Because there's no sin that he did not die for. Judas Baxley took things into his own hands and chose to walk away from Jesus. We have an opportunity to choose and say, you know what, Father? I ha- I- I'm not being fathered by you because I've turned my back. Even if it's only in one little hour, I'm not saying that you're out hooking up with Brad and I at 11.30 at night. But just little areas slip. Father, father me in that area. Don't, Lord, bring me in. What do you say? What is your spirit speaking to these things? How do you want me to behave in these areas? What behaviours do I need to change? It's not always easy. Because a lot of those little things just become habits, unthought of habits. Just, and it can be difficult to change. But ask him. Yeah, return to the Father. And I've finished, but one last little family thing. Because after we've seen ourselves, or I've been told that this church was, oh, this makes it sound bad, but anyway, um, full some years ago. Chock-a-block. Evidently, there's a few empty seats here. So what that tells me is every single person here, a lot of those people might have gone to other Every churches. single person here knows someone who has just stepped away from the Father's guidance. Now, that might not be the world's worst person. What is your role as a brother or sister to them? Now, there's an Old Testament verse that says, if you know someone is in danger, and it literally says in Ezekiel, of backsliding, and you don't offer them... um, 
to lead them back, that their blood is on your head. Now, I know how uncomfortable sometimes it might be to have a conversation with someone that you know that just might not be focused on the Father like maybe they once were. And let me say, it's not ever about going in there and saying, right, you should not be doing this. That is the wrong thing to be doing. You're a brother. You're trying to turn them towards the Father and not kick them further out the door. It's in love. I don't know how you gift wrap bad news. I've got no way of how you do that. It's just hard. But, but if you know someone, then maybe that is your role in this family at this time to be being with them and leading them back to the Father. Because God uses people to save people. God uses people to bring people back. We are part of his plan. That's, you know, that's just what it is. Music.